So good afternoon. Welcome to the panel, uh, Ecology and Agriculture from a Feminist Perspective. It's very nice to have you all here, also in a sunny day in Berlin. Uh, I'm very honored to have uh, here three amazing writers, researchers that are thinking, but just, not just thinking, but practicing environmental justice from different contexts and feminist backgrounds. They bring no non-neurocentric views for us to discuss, and we hope we have the chance to discuss. Uh, I have here Hetika Subramanian from India, Yvette Abrams, who is going to join us online from South Africa, and Dima Kadbi from Lebanon. Uh, I'll come back to their bios uh, with more details before each presentation. So we have the chance to concentrate in each of the bias because sometimes I feel people get lost when we just give a lot of information in the beginning. And I think it's a very, it's a really amazing uh, opportunity to listen from perspectives that see environmental struggles, not as something separated from social struggles, but as embedded in power relations. Uh, so not as, the separation between like nature and people as it could be elements apart. And so all of them, what connect their work or one of the points at least, is bringing nature into discussion on inequalities in our everyday lives as part of political disputes. We are gonna hear about gender, race, transnational inequalities, colonialism, and other elements that are part of the discussion about nature. And this is not so common in many, in many debates when we think about uh, environmental debates. So, and at the same time, they also bring nature and uh, the discussions about these issues for, for uh, a way of deeper transformation for co the eco 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 coexistence for many livelihoods and feminisms. So let's go for the first speaker, uh, Hechika. Hechika Subramanian is a researcher from India and one of the authors of the comic project Movements and Moments that you can see uh, drawn outside and is being presented, presented at the festival, shedding light on the close connection between feminisms and ecological issues in the Global South. Hitchik is a PhD candidate at the University of Cambridge in the Center for Gender Studies, examining issues of gender, labor, and an early marriage in the context of ecological crisis. Anchored at the intersections of marriage, migration, and girlhood stu studies, her doctoral research proposes to make visible the labor and experiences of adolescent girls in the con context of climate crisis. Uh, so, Hechika, hello. Hello, hello. <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. Yeah. Uh, as we were talking a bit about the project itself, uh, movements and, and moments, and your the, the work you have been developing on gender and different layers of power. Can you share a bit more about the project and the connections you have been making uh, yeah. to understand like environment from these perspectives of gender? Absolutely. So again, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for being here. Um, I think one of the things that I would want to begin with is the project that uh, you know we've been working with in collaboration with the Goethe Institute in Jakarta. And uh, the project, as we've been hearing, is called Movements and Moments. And uh, you know, what is interesting is that uh, we used comics as a format to talk about very pressing issues, uh, especially focusing on indigeneity, focusing on uh, feminist practices, focusing on very powerful, phenomenal uh, individuals who've been uh, resisting and, uh, you know, and for their resistances and resiliences on an everyday basis. And our protagonist uh, is Godavari Dange, who has been, uh, you know, spent, who spent the past 20 years uh, working on collectivizing women farmers in Marathwada, back in India. And uh, just to give you a context, Marathwada as a region is considered to be the epicenter of India's agrarian crisis. It is a land of thirst, and uh, it is a region where uh, you know, there are cyclical droughts that take place 
water drives every decision in the political economy at large. And um, in addition, or you know, concurrent or consequent to these ecological crises that we see, is a huge socio-cultural, historical sort of restructuring that's happening in the region as well. For instance, you know, we've been seeing a rise in um, early marriages over the years. We've been seeing a rise in small marginal farmers turning into footloose laborers, uh, you know, in very extractive industries like sugarcane. Uh, we've also been seeing a rise in infant mortality rates, uh, maternal mortality rates, all of which in a way is centered around the water crisis that we see in the region. And here we have a leader like Godavari Dange, who along with many other women, 60,000 women and more, um, you know, came up with a very indigenous solution. So I would want to highlight over here that when we think of climate change and climate crisis, we think of it from a very top-down sort of approach. You know, we sort of, it, it is a very Eurocentric approach in terms of looking at the situation and the crisis, coming up with solutions, coming up with interventions, which, you know, in a way with Godavari Dange's story has taught us cannot, it has to be very much rooted in the social context, in the cultural context, very much in the local context. So, for instance, in Godavari Dangi's case, she wasn't replicating an existing model or a framework. It was a model which was premised on the process. The process was very much part of the whole intervention itself, wherein they realized that one of the major problems of drought, for instance, was the fact that majority of the big farmers, the upper caste rich farmers, were growing sugarcane because it is a very lucrative crop, you know, because it's, it's also a cash crop you sell and you can make money. But it was also a very water intensive crop. It was a crop which was taking away water further away. And what, it's, what it also was doing was not feeding the families in the sense food insecurity continued because you know you don't eat sugarcane as everyday meals. And which is one of the reasons why with Godavari Dange along with the other women in the region came together and they said, okay, you know, one of the major reasons and one of the major things that we need to do is ensure there's food on everyone's plate. Let's begin with that. Let's look at drought from that context. And which is exactly what they did in a way that they said, okay, you know, women don't have land holding. That is another reason wherein in the region, women are not considered as farmers. They work on small farms, they work in their family farms, but they're not recognized as farmers. Their labor goes unpaid. So which is why even getting that land was an issue. And what Godavari Dangi did was come up with a half acre to one acre model of farming, wherein in a small piece of land, you grow 36 varieties of food crops. You know, they're short-term crops, not very water intensive. You know, grow crops which will actually feed your children, feed you. And that in turn is, I think, a very interesting and innovative indigenous model, which is also sustainable. You know, it is not a model which is like a technological intervention in a way, wherein of course they've been working with government authorities and it has spread over like now 60,000 farms and more. Um, so basically going back to what you were saying, I think the idea around like, you know, connecting these things, they don't happen as you know, they, they all happen simultaneously and concurrently and coming up with local indigenous solutions becomes very, very uh, important. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I think we have already a lot of elements in, in what you said. And now we would, um, we would try to have Yvette. Can we have her now? Ah, she's there. Hello, Yvette. Do you hear us? I hear you perfectly, yes. Great. <laughs> so Yvette, has a, Yvette Abrahams has a PhD in economic history from the University of Cape Town. She has worked for academia, government, and various NGOs on issues related to gender equality and policy and practice. Yvette has published widely both locally and internationally on various topics related to gender equality, queer theory, climate change, and the history of First Nations South Africans. She's a small farmer producing soaps and body butters based on many years of research and growing indigenous plants. She's currently interim director, Sun and Koi Center, University of Cape Town. And she also added when we were discussing about her bio, and now uh, I'm gonna quote her directly. Uh, the most important fact about me is that I am a third generation genocide survivor of the German war against Damara and he Heheru from 1905 to 1907. It has shaped my entire life. Anything else is just details. 
So uh, in one text that you wrote, Yvette, you say, as part of, of that work I realized as a, a small farmer, uh, that you can write a hundred papers and attend a thousand conferences, but nothing has the impact of actually practicing what you preach. Uh, can you share about how being a small farmer had ch uh, has changed your trajectory and knowledge production? And could you ta talk a bit about how does it intersect with the issues of gender and race that you have uh, been thinking about in all those years? Send you uh, greetings okay. from Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, um, I, I farm, it's a little, it's a two and a half acre um, farm. It's about an hour east of Cape Town. And I don't actually use most of it. About two thirds of my land I, I don't use. I Or should I say I grow olive trees on it and, and olive trees, as you know, take about 10 years to fruit. They're just about at the point where they're, they're, they're fruity. They are now teenagers, so I'm going to fence that part in and put sheep under, and so that is a little ecology on its own. With the reason why I don't you really use any more land than that to grow intensively is I don't have enough water. So just like in India, my, my major constraint is not land, it's water. Um, every we, we are we sort of the opposite of the Mediterranean. We have a winter rainfall and 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 long dry summers, but our winters are like right now. It's just about our autumn. We're about heading into winter, and we actually have our own species of, of olive tree. Um, it, it's a fascinating insight into nature and power because our, our olive tree is called the European olive African version. And of course that had to do with then classifying the olive first in Europe. Um, you know, with equal justice, we could call it, call your olives the, the European version of the African olive. <laughs> um, but there you go, nature and power is only in the naming. Um, and, and the reason why I've been a small farmer for 16 years is, has been, I started off as an academic that got intensely involved in the relationship between theory and practice. And, and especially when it comes to climate change, you know, my feeling is there's, let me not say enough theory, but there's a lot of theory going around. Um, but, but it presents a particular research problematic. You, you have to sometimes first build the alternative before you can research it. Um, I've done this in renewable energy, you know, when you say, oh, we want more solar power and then the fossil fuel magnates will tell you, no, but it, it will lose jobs. Well, then you literally have to build a solar power station and then measure how many jobs it creates in order to make your policy, or at least in South Africa, that's what you had to do. In the same way on my farm, I wanted to create an 18th century ecology because everybody was telling me this is not going to work. So my field is the 18th century. I recreated an 18th century ecology and actually spent the last four years feeding myself and my family from it. Um, you know, developing the soap and the body butter as a way to get a little bit of cash income. But it's kind of like, first I had to prove that it worked. Now, I can go back and I can research and I can crunch the numbers and I can say, this is how many jobs it creates, this is how much carbon it sequesters. But, but I guess what I'm trying to say is climate change presents in some ways a unique research problem. And there are many times when you have to start from the practice and then develop theory rather than kind of the traditional way, which is vice versa. Um, I guess I want to round this up by saying the, the reason why the genocide plays such a deep role in my life, I was born with post-traumatic stress disorder. And, and then for three generations, we've been suffering from inherited post-traumatic stress. Um, and it was really only as an adult that I figured this out. Because, of course, the way you inherit post-traumatic stress is you grow up thinking certain patterns of behavior are perfectly normal. Um, but they're not. Um, 
What it's done for me is it's encouraged me to think about wellness as a state of being because it's something that I've never had. I've, I've reached a certain level of sanity due to, you know, there's lots of research out there about inherited PTSD. There, there's many, many years in therapy. Uh, we have our entire department of psychology focused on decolonizing. So I have all these tools that the three generations before me didn't have. But I asked myself the question, hmm, I wonder what it was like to be born you know, not having to start conversations with, oh, I'm a third generation genocide survivor. So excuse me, my memory is a little bad. You know, <laughs> um, there must be a whole planet of people out there that don't have that experience. Uh, and so trying to imagine another state of life, trying to imagine living in my 18th century ecology and living a zero carbon life where I'm not stealing from my descendants. And, and, and being well as a state of being, as a normal and natural state of being where, where the exception is illness. And, and, and that's really helped me get a totally different view because, you know, normally we study health from the opposite end. We study pathology, we study illnesses, and then we say, oh, how do we fix it? Whereas in actual fact, maybe what we should we're doing is studying wellness and then looking at where we depart from it. Thank you so much. <laughs> and it, it's good, we, we could hear you very well, no? I think people, I, I think we could hear very well. Let's go to our third speaker before we, we deep into discussion. Uh, Jima Kadbi is a writer and a researcher from Lebanon. She's the co-founder and director of the feminist organization in Beirut, the Knowledge Workshop. Jima has a PhD in women's gender and sexuality studies and currently reflects on feminist movements in, li in light of the current economic, political and social crisis in Lebanon. She is one of the authors and editors of the book, What Remains? Ecofeminist Pursuits, which is just about to be launched in two weeks. Wow, that's a big achievement. <laughs> uh, will be published in Arabic so far. And the book was developed by the Knowledge Workshop, bringing together writers, activists, researchers, and artists in Lebanon as they reflect on conver convergences of environmental and feminist movements and issues. And yesterday I asked her what moves her in her work right now. And she answered that a better and more just world is possible where we can be free and safe and healthy and creative. Logically, it shouldn't be that hard. Uh, in reality, it will take some time, but we can do it. I hope, I also hope so. I think we all hope so. Well, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk about the book that's about to come out, that's currently in print, um, and about the context in which um, it was developed. Um, and the main uh, word that's going to appear again and again um, as I speak, is crisis, and the other word is collapse. Um, so, in Lebanon, we are living in the midst of like a multi-level collapse. And when, in any case, when you have a crisis, your priorities obviously shift. Uh, and when it's something on such a national level, um, when the banking sector collapses and the whole economy that's built on it and around it, uh, then you have the domino, of, domino effect of collapse of educational sector, uh, medical sector, all public institutions and services. Then everybody turns into full survivor mode. Um, and then so many things become both urgent and more intense and yet not a priority at the same time. So in such a situation, I mean, there's always the questions of are mental health issues urgent? Is healing urgent? 
is making a book and reading, are these urgent or are creative cultural spaces and productions? Uh, and the answer is, of course, they are. Um, and this is our, one of our main sort of tools of resistance. Uh, but also at the same time, you know, with people having lost lifelong savings, with people uh, losing access to medical care from basic medicine to cancer treatments, uh, with shortages of bread and fuel and uh, everything else. Um, then you understand if there's resistance to your kind of resistance and you understand why these questions come up. And so it's, it was in this sort of tense space that we were living through and everybody was living through that the book was created. Um, and as the knowledge workshop, I mean, as feminists, we always sort of live in that mode of, you know, being seen as not a priority or feminist issue is not seen as a priority. Um, so in some way we have practice in, in that, uh, you know, in that kind of uh, dealing with that. But, um, you know, on another level, uh, as the knowledge workshop, we've sort of always, and, you know, as feminists, we've always um, understood the connection between different issues, gender, economy, uh, ecology, but with the current situation, it becomes such an intimate experience that uh, economic collapse and environmental destruction, um, the violence against women increasing and um, the streets becoming a more uh, unsafe space because the streets are getting, you know, get darker um, and hyper masculinity with, you know, activating that kind of masculinity of defending oneself and the family and the tribe and all that, um, or, you know, the community. Um, and we've always understood, too, as feminists, uh, we come from a long tradition of um, understanding the importance of connecting communities and generations. But again, in this particular moment, it's become so much more urgent um, because we've seen how issues are so interconnected uh, that social struggles and people within them also uh, sort of uh, one front or try to build that what we call infrastructure of solidarity. So as we were working on the book, as we were working with artists and writers and researchers, we were also doing um, all kinds of trying to create conversations and solidarities around uh, issues of ecology and feminism. Um, and I can say sort of the way we framed it, because what I think KW also brings uh, to the equation is that we've also always been influenced by indigenous feminism um, and environmental indigenous thought, which um, for me is uh, two basic things. One is the interconnection and kinship between, you know, human, non-human uh, beings around us. Uh, but the other aspect of it is that we're accountable not only to the world we are living in, but to generations and what future generations inherit from us and what world we create for them. Um, so that was also uh, sort of shaped the way we approached um, all issues. Um, I mean, I can say more or can stop now and then open it for questions. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. At first, thank you all that you kept the time. So now we have the time for discussion, and, and I think it's also nice. Before opening for, uh, for questions from the audience, I will first ask you from the panel, because sometimes we keep in this situation of speaking but not having the chance to talk to each other and qu ask questions. So first thing would be if you have questions to each other, I will already include one from, from me because I would do it before for you and I didn't about the, if you could bring in your, uh, a bit about the, the concept of ecofeminism, not just the concept, but like the practices of ecofeminism. What, what, maybe what does it mean for you now after the, the book? You know, what, what stayed with you from it? And maybe we collect, if you have also questions, do you have for, do you also have for Jim or 
we collect for each other maybe and do yeah, around. I think, yeah. yeah, I think just one of the things that came up, um, and I think we can discuss that, was to do with conversations around intersectionality because when we're talking about, um, you know, not all women have the same experiences as well. And, you know, especially with a history back home in India as well, a lot of the feminist movement initially was basically driven by, uh, in, you know, women in urban spaces, by upper caste women and, you know, with different sort of class capital as well. So one of the things that I was quite interested, I think we'll speak to each other, is around the intersections of how, you know, class, race, caste, and these sort of social experiences and structures intersect with sort of uh, environmental action or mitigation that we are talking about. And then it, would it be for the two of them? Yeah, I mean, I think it'll be interesting to know from the other experiences as well. Okay, yeah. nice. And Yvette, do you have questions for the other panelists? Well, well, I have a very flaky question, which is, I understand that Lebanon is the home of the world's oldest olive trees. Apparently, there's a grove of trees that are almost 6,000 years old. Um, I could be wrong, but this is what I've read. And I was just curious how that affects your sense of time. I mean, when, when you have trees that old, how do you, does it not affect the way you think around the world? You, you know, that, 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 I'm, I'm very curious about that, um, about my, my Indian sisters. I just want to send you solidarity. Needless to say, we're huge fans of Vandana Shiva and, and, and the movement that the Chief has waged against against you know some of the world's biggest capitalists. So, so yes, um, yeah, I don't want to sound like a, a fan at this moment, but really, thank you, thank you so much for your country's contribution to to the ecological movement. Jima, do you want to uh, ask ask a question? We, we are just collecting the, the yeah, first round. Um, I mean, with Yvette asking about olive trees, maybe I can ask about a particular kind of olive trees as well. But I was also very interested in sort of imagining uh, our lives outside of illness and disease and trauma, and if that figures into sort of the research and practice, um, and how it might uh, figure into uh, research or it would change some tools of research. Um, and I was also very interested in that non-top-down approach um, because climate change can become something really abstract. Uh, but in both of our contexts, like in the context of Lebanon, it's food sovereignty and issues related to pollution and the air we breathe and water we drink and all that. Um, so, yeah, I think if you can talk a little bit more about that and what what's different and what your particular kind of ecofeminism as you see it sort of adds to, to that sort of conversation. So maybe we go in the same uh, order as in the beginning. I would just have to be to do my role now and say like, please, can you say like in two to three minutes? Because then I, we open to more questions. Um, yeah, I think it's been a very rich exchange. And I think the question that you were speaking about um, is very, very interesting because I think one of the things is that the very vocabulary of climate change is not something that is used back home. Like, I mean, in terms of the experiences, like say Godavari Dange or in the work that I'm doing as part of my doctoral research, local communities don't call it as, it's not an abstract concept, right? It's a lived experience and it's not a new experience. It's been something wherein, like we're talking about eco-feminist movements. We've had activist movements which have been going on for like in the last century and different forms of resistances which have probably not made it to mainstream media and conversations. Um, but I think it's just, that's one of the reasons why we, even when we are doing research or when we are like sort of uh, collectivizing and speaking to communities, one of the things is to understand the whole climate crisis in everyday vocabulary. Like, you know, what does it mean on an everyday basis? Are we talking about water shortage? Are we talking about, you know, child marriage? Are we talking about the fact that, you know, earlier I take like three, three kilometers I have to go and get my water and today with incessant droughts I'll have to walk six kilometers. I mean you know it's about like accessing resources which we need to bring into the vocabulary around uh, the climate crisis and that I think that is exactly why I was saying in terms of you know leaving it to communities as well or learning from community knowledges over the years over the past century and more 
in terms of how they have been negotiating it on an everyday basis, you know. Um, like I was talking about earlier about Godavari Dange, one of the highlights of that movement, the fact that it is sustained and it has grown and continues to grow is the fact that it is relatable, it is relevant and it is doable. I mean, you know, it was not something wherein they have to invest a lot of money and buy a certain technology and, you know, do all of it. Here we're talking about basic problem about right to food and root right to food security. And, you know, you basically talk about it as a lived experience. You know, you're not talking to them about, you're not talking to communities saying it's climate crisis, which it is, but in a way in um, like rethinking vocabulary. So in a way, I think that's exactly what, and these movements are spreading across. There are various ways in which communities are resisting and engaging, but I think we need to put a ear to the ground and then think of uh, policies from the bottom up. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yvette, do you wanna take the floor? Um, well, look, I think for me and, and many of my generation, what, what people like Vandana Shiva did, and, and of course, Wangari Matai from Africa, people like Masanobu Fukuoka from, from Japan, what they did was to say, it's okay to have a PhD and be a farmer. In, in fact, I'll take it one step further, if you want to be a proper PhD, you actually need to be a farmer. And, and you know, I've written about the three of them often, and, and I cite extensively of their work because what they brought from what they were doing was a way of revisioning the way we think about science and, and the way we think about truth. Um, you know, I've had this discussion myself. I was promoting biogas in Cape Town and and this woman from a trade union said, what, you want the working class to clean shit? And I said, no, I want the intellectuals to clean shit. I don't think you can be an intellectual at all unless you've been running a biogas digester. And, and that kind of thinking I got from our forebears, um, you know, to, to, to break down the barriers, or, or should I say to, to de-westernize the way we thought about intellectual activity. They, they made it acceptable. In fact, they made it normative. Wangari Matai said, if you want to be an intellectual, you have to plant forests. And, and you know, 20 years later, what can we say? But, oh, you were right. Um, so, so this thing of positing the counterfactual, I want to say... You know, what I've tried to do, although in my case I had to literally replant it, but what is it like to sit in a grove of 6,000-year olive trees and imagine the time when those olives were planted before the twin rivers civilized. It was quite probably a matriarchal society in which those olives were planted. They probably fitted into quite different harvesting and and, and, you know, routines, but yet the, the, the soft soap that is made from those olives, it's made everywhere. It's made in the Mediterranean, it's made in Northern Africa. We make a, a, an indigenous version here in South Africa. There are some very enduring things that are of human, human life that, that actually have never disappeared. And when we start to look for those things, how would our skins feel different if we were using the, I believe in Morocco they call it the Baldi soap. I'm sorry, I don't know what it is in Lebanon. But would, would our skins maybe be slightly more decolonized or de, de I'm not, you see, I can't even find the word. But, but somewhere in that mix, I believe we would find that state of wellness that will give us almost a ruler, a measuring stick with which we can look at our current state. I, I hope that makes sense what I'm saying. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, talking about olive trees, I mean, that's sort of one of the wounds. Uh, one, the disconnection from history. I mean, I'm sure in a superficial mythological some myth or something of like uh, 
ancient civilization, there's something there um, related to the trees. Um, but a lot of the times it's not. I mean, there's that disconnect from nature um, and disconnect from history and you know collective amnesia and all that. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it would be very interesting and wonderful to sort of um, have that have the trees sort of open the questions or uh, questions to ask or practices to do. Um, but I also wanted to answer Ratika's uh, question about sort of the intersectionality. And so like in our book, one of our researchers, Asmal Hajal, was looking at the pollution of uh, one of the major rivers in Lebanon, the Litani River. Um, and she saw how like the uh, refugee women who are close to the river, they're the ones who are least able to leave um, because they don't have that freedom of mobility. Um, they're least able to access medical care when they get um, diseases. They're the ones taking care of their family, of course, because that's women's uh, main uh, roles. Um, but also, I mean, we, we heard, or the researcher, um, documented stories of a lot of these women saying, you know, um, they had escaped war, a war in Syria where they were being bombed by planes that they couldn't see. And now they were in this place where they were being um, also, uh, you know, um, sometimes killed, but, you know, affected uh, by viruses and germs that they cannot see. Um, and so, yeah, we, I mean, there's always like, there's the more privileged you are, the more there's this assumption of being sheltered um, to a certain, de uh, you know, degree, of course. Um, so we definitely see that appear in, in every ecological crisis. And this is where you go into, you know, environmental racism and all that. Thank you so much. We have a lot, no? We could go on like forever. <laughs> uh, maybe we open to, do we have a mic in the audience? I'll just like uh, bring some things that I, that I think we are putting together maybe before opening because um, Yvette was also saying like decolonize and we are all, we, you, we were bringing different ways of de decolonizing, but from, uh, uh, there, are, there is a group in Latin America, I come from Latin America, like just uh, connecting many regions here now. And there is a, a, group, a group called Glefas, and they say like decolonize won't be easy because decol decolonize will hurt. Decolonize will take a lot of uh, things out. So it's not possible just to talk about environmental issues, taking, thinking about the future if we do not unveil the past and the present. And I think it's really powerful how the three of you are bringing a lot of elements to do this. I just wanted to like kind of trying to bring things together. Uh, so do we have questions? Can you please raise your hands? Enjoy this opportunity, people, to have like three completely, like not completely many things connected, but different perspectives on environmental and feminisms here now. So one. <laughs> Thank you very much. No, not works. Thank you very much for that interesting um, talk. I enjoyed it very much. And um, I really like the way you talk about these things and um, how you connect it also, interconnect it. And that's actually also the question I have. How connected are the eco-feminist movements or the consciousness for ecofeminism in the world like how much are especially Europeans aware of your perspective what's your experience when you have the 
exchange? Like, do you think they are aware of your perspectives? Is it a question for the three of them? Whoever okay. feels happy to answer that. Right. Let's just see if there are more, just if we collect, are there more questions? Okay, now we have two more. <laughs> Maybe we collect these three and come back. So you and then you, please. Um, hello, um, thank you for um, being here and sharing your experiences. Um, I wanted to ask, and maybe this is something that all three of you could reflect on, but it was uh, mainly brought on by what Ritika was saying uh, about the difference or how plausible it is, like talking about climate change and how it, affect, it affects people's lives and the gender perspective at that. The difference between the top down or the bottom up, because when we see what is happening on a global scale in terms of the action, there's always this focus on world leaders getting together and trying to figure out what to do. And there's this constant talk about the emissions and reducing the emissions. And climate change and how it affects people's lives is way more than just this. And the gender aspect of it is probably one of the challenges of it. Like, how do you show those intersection and how it affects like the gender element in, into it? And I was wondering if, we, you could talk more about how you see this happening, and like the disconnect maybe also, and how maybe we can see a kind of rapprochement in terms of, because you also need the policies to change, right? I mean, being active on the ground and changing and the community work helps, but also there's the larger, which is the policies. And if I may ask another question in a way, because it also relates, um, um, Seeing like specifically um, also like what Ritika was saying, uh, the lived experiences, and maybe this is a way of sort of making it more accessible, like it's not an abstract, it's actually a lived experience. And I'm wondering if you could talk more ab ab about that and um, like also the, the issues that came up in the book that Dima talked about, like the lived experiences and the, the difference based on um, the research that came up or the artistic contributions that uh, are present. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. We have great questions. Uh, there was one more here now. Yeah, thank you so much. It's really, really interesting to have all the different perspectives. And because we were talking in the discussion before this one, we were talking about intergenerational differences in movements. And I was wondering, because ecofeminism is also rooted in the 70s already, there were ecofeminists back then, and a lot has happened since then. Um, so we have the climate crisis getting worse and worse, and then we have the internet, and maybe this is also, there's also a link to the question with the interconnection and how ecofeminism maybe became more of a movement instead like of another of other approaches we had like earlier in the 70s or something. Hmm. Okay, great. We have deep, great questions. So <laughs> let's do maybe now change a bit. We start with Jima. Um, yeah, maybe I can bring together uh, the first and the last question in some way. Um, I mean, I think eco-feminists, and because maybe it's the ecological aspect, the connection aspect, the, you know, the, you know, the challenging borders, really, water being a natural boundary, you know, uh, versus like man-made borders and countries and national borders like that. So for me, ecofeminism is about sort of transnationality and um, challenging borders, even like, you know, if I think of a river being polluted and it's again something that came up um, in the research, like it's, it's not just affecting 
the people living, you know, close to the river, it's affecting everybody because the river, you know, um, it goes to the harvest or to the plants and people eat it all over. And so it's, it's, there's no way to sort of contain uh, a lot of ecological destruction. But um, are eco-feminists connected? I mean, I think... Um, in some ways, I think there's always attempts at making connections. Um, there are connections that are easier to access, um, spaces that are easier to access, and some people who are, you know, more able uh, to make these connections uh, than others. And maybe here that has something to do with privileges a lot of the times, or you know, being in the right place at the right time. Um, but I think there's definitely a genuine interest for people to learn and to open uh, and to learn about context that they don't know much about and to see where the connections are. Um, and it takes me in some way to the last question about, um, you know, in Lebanon at least, uh, there isn't, that history of eco-feminism. Um, there isn't that movement. Uh, there are individuals more and more who are identifying as eco-feminists. Um, but, and when we worked on the book really, we, we didn't use the, the word eco-feminism until the title. So, you know, when we put out abstracts and called for submissions and talked to artists and activists and all that, we were not using the word ecofeminism. We were talking about mutualities and reciprocities and parallels between um, the environmental justice movements and feminist movements and looking for connections there. Um, so there isn't that same sort of trajectory as European feminism. Um, and it depends with different, because it's not a movement, with different individuals, they're getting um, sort of uh, their understanding of ecofeminism from very different places. And I think that takes me to Joelle's question. Um, so there are, there are at least two frameworks. There are more than one, two. But if you look at two frameworks, there's I th definitely one that focuses on policy. And there are many alter, you know, many, uh, organizations and initiatives in Lebanon working on policy change. Um, but the people we were talking to were um, a lot of the times not organizations, but groups of people's collectives, co-ops, trying to create alternative models of living together and alternative, like smaller alternative economies or different ways of relating to the land and, you know, creating community gardens, um, making more accessible spaces and more accessible uh, ways to access, you know, food and all that. Um, so there's definitely, you know, the, the model where you're talking to world leaders and trying to change uh, the, uh, the way world leaders think and have that trickle down uh, to smaller countries like Lebanon, but the ones we were interested in were following a different model. Um, yeah. Do you want to okay, go? from there? Yeah, um, great. In a way that um, I think it resonates with what I was also thinking of talking about, but one of the broader questions around experiences and the whole bottom-up sort of approach um, I think, you know, one of the things is I could talk about a few experiences, uh, you know, so I run a project called Climate Brides where we're trying to look at the links between early marriage and the climate crisis in various ways. And one of the things is, of course, when there is a sudden disaster which takes place, say like, you know, a tsunami or an earthquake, it's more like responses or where there's a big flood. So, for example, say back in South Asia, Bangladesh is extremely vulnerable to floods and cyclones. And um, in the aftermath, very often, you know, there are these relief camps which are set up and, uh, you know, wherein families are, of course, evacuated and placed there. And both, a lot of news reports coming in, community sort of responses, humanitarian interventions have revealed that the extent of violence against women multiplies manifold in the aftermath of a crisis of this nature. 
uh, whether it is domestic abuse, uh, whether it is in terms of even accessing resources, um, you know, it and the labor increases, you know, the basic unpaid work that you need to do now also increases in the context of an environmental crisis. And the other thing is, of course, a rise in child marriages, which are reported in a lot of cases, you know, we may not look at these links directly, but in a way, in terms of sort of child marriage is an economic decision. It is not just like a cultural sort of decision. And a climate crisis of this nature, in a way, intensifies that decision-making process. And this has been reported in various contexts. I mean, another context would be the tsunami that hit the South Asia, hit South Asia and Southeast Asia in early 2000s. A lot of families could access government subsidies as a married couple, you know, and which in a way then pushed a lot of families to get their daughters or sons married so that they could access a lot of subsidies and other uh, interventions, support schemes and other things. So in a way, it sort of is speaking about these experiences. We may not think of it in the context of, it is not an either or, basically. I mean, I'm not saying that only community intervention should be done, we should not think of policy. It's basically and, you know, and sort of having both of them in dialogue and conversation, uh, essentially to sort of see how each of them can inform the other because they're all part of the same problem and the same solution. And finally, I think I just wanted to uh, wrap up with what you were talking about. I think around intersectionality, I think, comes into play here. Because very often, you know, we don't think of sexualities as, you know, also different experiences. And in the case of an environmental crisis, it sort of, again, affects different people very differently. And more people, like the poster says, affects, has disproportional impacts. Uh, so, for instance, in a lot of urban spaces, especially when there are floods, and, you know, we've seen this even in Indonesia and other cities there, um, a lot of communities, especially trans persons, couldn't access a lot of government schemes because, again, you know, it's highly gendered in terms of even accessing these spaces, you know, it, what becomes like a safe space, what doesn't, and, you know, whether they feel safe in, like, these open relief camps. I think, in a way, we need to rethink, and, you know, basically, the point is listen from the ground up and, you know, listen to these stories as we think of policies, yeah. And before passing the word to Yvette, I would just call again something you said in your first uh, part of your talk when you said, women are not always considered farmers. And this is a, is a big thing, part of the context, not right? to, to understand the connections. It's, it's very strong to think about that. Yvette, could you hear us? Uh -huh. Yeah? Yes, yes, great. thank you. Nice. Um, these were great, great questions. They were also big questions and, and, and I'm, I'm afraid I'm not going to do them justice, but, but I'll do my best in, in the short amount of time that we have. Um, I think interconnectedness has to start with the self. Uh, um, you know, this thing that Marx called alienation, it didn't happen overnight. It took about a thousand years. Um, you know, when I, I asked myself the question, when I came to a level of sanity such that I was able to ask myself the question, what makes people get on a boat and cross an ocean to go kill completely random strangers in a piece of African desert? Like, like from my culture, it made no sense. But of course, when you start asking those questions and you start looking at particularly the history of southern Germany, um, you look at the enclosures, the land thefts, the killing of over a thousand years of killing of witches, which of course killed not just, you know, medicinal knowledge, but a very, very deep ecological knowledge, a sense of ritual, um, which in turn and buttress, you know, sanity. The ritual has a lot to do with emotional health. And a thousand years of stamping that out, then my question begins to make sense. Everybody's indigenous to some way. What is the break, the violence, the abuse that forces a person to become unindigenous to self? And, and in healing that wound, then are we then maybe ready to connect to, to other people? Is, is, does that not have to start there? So, so coming from the deep philosophy, I want to say I've been working with an organization based in Berlin for many years called, called Gender CC. Um, and, and yes, in the beginning, you know, these were the deep discussions we'd have 
in, you know, descendants from opposite sides of the genocide, it, we, it was something we felt we had to do so that we can be clear, we can be honest, we can be transparent. Um, but, but of course, you know, we got together to fight climate change. There was something bigger than the past that united us. So we were very motivated to, to overcome these differences and to lay the past to rest. Um, and, and, and today, I mean, it's over a decade later, uh, gender CC, you know, what I liked about them from the, the beginning was their determination to build organizational capacity in the global south. Um, so much so that we would have arguments that say, oh, we need to relocate headquarters to the south. And we'd say, no, we're not ready yet. We're not ready yet. You know, the, the level of accounting that has to be done, we're not, we're still out in the field. So you do that admin work and we'll carry on. The, so, 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 you know, once we were able to talk as equals, we would even hold them back from the radical work that they were wanting to do. And, and that has continued to this day, that kind of cooperation. And we've built a solidarity that will start from the rural women in Bangladesh. We worked in Bangladesh in, in um, 2013. Um, we now just finished working with the All India Women's Conference. Um, we could take the stuff that came from there all the way up to the level of the UNFCCC through the facilitation that gender CC made. We could talk to the, 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 the decision makers at the top with the voices that came from the bottom. And a lot of the movement at the UN level around gender and climate change has come from that kind of cooperation. So, so I guess what I'm trying to say is, yes, we are divided, and yes, there are inequalities of power, but it is possible to work for a common humanity stemming from our, our work to make turn ourselves into human. I hope, I hope that makes some kind of sense. Well, we still have time to discuss a bit more, and uh, it's nice that we already got many interconnections no, so far. Do we have uh, more questions from the audience? We have one. Um, hi, and thank you very much for all your input, and I'm very curious to know more about um, all the research you're doing and also the action you're doing. Um, for me, it's more of a, I would like to have your thoughts. It is a questioning and also some things I wonder about. Um, we're all looking at movements or instances of resistance and where indigenous communities try to do better and sometimes even succeed. And I think that's important to look at it from this perspective. and. I think this is also something that um, is important to communicate about and see what succeeded and see what resistance works and so on. Um, but sometimes I also realize that there is another truth sometimes that sometimes also indigenous communities or local communities um, do support and would like um, or are okay with the processes of commodification of nature and of the environment. Sometimes out of necessity, but sometimes just out of um, determinism in some ways that this is going to happen anyway, so I'd rather take the best out of it. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about it most of the times. <laughs> um, and I would like to have your thoughts on it since um, all of your work and research is very grounded in reality. Um, but also what are your emotions about it? I, I think that's also important. Thank you. More? If not, I will also add one <laughs> to, to the last question. Uh, now that we already like had the first part, um, and also maybe to provocate a bit in this balance. Now we are always somehow in this balance about talking about very strong things and very heavy things sometimes and also have some 
possibilities of trans transformation, of radical transformation and so on. But could you also elaborate a bit about how do you feel in your struggles in, as researchers, activists, in your daily lives, uh, writers, in collectives? What are the things you feel that are limits or interruptions in the work that you do? Because we are coming together in many situations now, but it's always hard to change things. So if you could talk a bit, uh, yeah, how you, you feel it can be like very concrete or not. <laughs> Let's let's do then Ivete first now. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I think intersectionality has many layers, and the level that I grapple the most with is is the situation where you are simultaneously oppressed and privileged. Um, I'm almost sixty. My generation, I believe, has been the the most carbon-emitting generation ever in the history of humankind. And, and my generation built a wealth based on those carbon emissions that I don't think ever will be enjoyed by, by any other generation, just in terms of material. We're never going to, to reach those levels of material wealth again for the simple reason that we pretty much burn most of the carbon that was the basis of it. And, and, and so I, too, have to, climate change is interesting because it really throws you on the question of your own complicity. Um, I'm the one who got up in the morning and went to my day job and earned lots of money and, and you know, would fly to Johannesburg for a meeting in the morning and fly back in the evening. This was before I knew about climate change. But... You know, I was the one who took the money that I earned and, and, and drew hundreds of meters of plastic irrigation that I'm now going to have to tear up now that I'm more aware of the dangers of plastic. But but so, so you know, there's a way in which one of the things I do is support a youth and climate change organization. Um, they have shares in my soap company, for instance, because... I had to begin by acknowledging that simply by virtue of my age, I have a complicity and a privilege that, that I somehow have to hand over or, or make reparations for or, or, or make right. Um, I have a four-year-old nephew who, who loves dinosaurs and and you know he will he will reenact dramas and, and the more I know about the, 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 the climate limits that we have broken and how deep the crisis is, the more I look at him and I think, is this child trying to teach us something about how to go extinct with grace? Quite honestly, is, is, this, is this the end of our evolution? And squarely my generation and my parents' generation, these middle-class blacks that rose to have to bear that responsibility. Mm -hmm. Now, 2021, although there's a historic debt and a historic sign, the world's two big, the biggest increase in carbon emission was China and India. And that had to do with the growing middle class. So how do we accept responsibility for our privilege and make reparations to those children who will never have what we have? Who wants to jump in? Um, yeah, taking off from that, I think, um, in a way, I feel like, it, in a way, also responds to your question, I think is all about access to resources and access to opportunities. Um, in a way that, I mean, the kind of work that I have been doing is centered around feminist research practice, and in a way which, where you're, just, you're not just producing knowledge, but it's the very process of producing it, making it a collaborative effort, which sort of makes it what it is. Um, so in a way, what does that actually mean? In a way that where we're talking about is that ensuring that we have enough resources to do this kind of research, ensuring that we have enough opportunities that along with me, we also have Godavari Dange, who's able to you know, 
travel to these places and is able to you know tell her story in a way and that comes in with the ability of i think and that comes in and which is necessary is that where when she spoke about was this whole idea of consciousness of privilege itself uh you know engaging with our privilege and sort of saying that you know climate change is something or the climate crisis is something which is already affecting so many communities and of course there's daily accountability and everything else but also questioning these structures questioning the oppressive structures first and then sort of seeing what they are doing you know i mean um one of the things that i was recently reading about and actually thinking about is that we expect a lot of indigenous communities to resist because you know in the sense that we think it the onus of resistance lies in them without really questioning the structures that are oppressing these uh realities so you know we turning the gaze i think makes it very very crucial in terms of saying that of course these are decisions of survival these are child marriages cannot only be for instance looked at from a legal perspective and said you know but we need to sort of see how they are sort of fitting into the local economy in the context of an ecological crisis so broadly speaking i think it's this whole idea of questioning oppressive structures and you know and listening to solutions from the ground up in that sense yeah and just to because it also comes to the point when uh it puts a lot of people and communities in the, in a position of vulnerability you know as well just in the position of vulnerability and we, then we take we like some visions take out of it all, all the powerful things as well no and at the same time like if we are in this in between position you know like to, uh, coming from the global south so to say but living in europe for example and seeing okay but is it for example the 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 livelihoods that exist in europe is it also fine like is it fine to live just one way of living and having all the others just disappearing is it there are many layers behind it no you want to take from there yeah i think i want to go off from uh, where ritika and uh, ended with uh, both research and survival uh, being keywords so at the knowledge workshop we uh, one of our main uh, tools and research is a sort of a, almost feels like not adequate word for it because we work a lot with oral history and women's stories and that really brings out the nuances uh of what women have to do to survive and uh women's knowledges and land based knowledge and all that uh so you start to get sort of the different perspectives um different choices different viewpoints um and for me that's that's really important um but i mean to go to the question of the transformation and limitation because i'm still thinking about it and i and that's like the big question uh for all of us and i don't know if i have of course i haven't figured it out otherwise i'll let you know and we'll all you know uh solve it but i mean we're facing so much and you know i think any feminist in any position is facing so much especially when she's conscious of like different uh you know different forces intersectionality and all that um and the more in a context of crises and uh socioeconomic marginalization and all that um the more uh people and feminists are facing so I like what Evet suggested about like uh accountability and self accountability and you know the issue with the big limitation is both that we've internalized so much um that it starts with the self but also that there's so much against us um and both you know sort of then being in that position where you know you want to be understanding with yourself and uh you know how you survive and you know what you do to survive and how you have to you know live in a, on a daily basis um but also always like we're always thinking about ideals and best practices so just never always being in that never there uh just always trying so it's our constant struggle um 
but we'll figure it out. <laughs> It's hard. Um, so, okay, we have 15 minutes. We can be, like, I can also open the question for you. Do you want to, like, go to final considerations? We take one more. I check if there is one more, more questions and we come back to final considerations, maybe. So, do we have more questions from the audience? That's the last round, so if you have a question, please jump in now. No? I always give some seconds because people feel like <laughs> shy sometimes. And But okay. Um, yeah, I was, I was not sure if someone has... So we have, that's also good that we have time like for final considerations after the, the first pressure of the <laughs> first talk. Let's go, let's go then, can we restart with you? You can also, if you want to leave questions, I think it's also fine to, for us to think, no? some provocations as well. Um, so yeah, I think we've been discussing a lot of nuances and we've been discussing a lot of like comparisons and sort of particularities as well. Uh, but to sum up, I think, uh, you know, one of the core aspects of like we were talking about ground up approaches, we were talking about having different sort of intersectional conversations amongst other things. I think one of the key elements over here, especially when we're looking at the links between gender and the climate crisis, which in the context of just the academic space, the research space is still a very, is still relatively recent and growing in terms of studying these intersections. Um, but I think one of the core aspects boils down to what I began with was the whole element around labor, you know, acknowledging and recognizing and also remunerating um, labor of a gendered labor in a way. Uh, because I think one of the biggest impacts uh, of the climate crisis is going to be on increased labor burdens, whether it is to go and collect water to, you know, for the household for that particular day, whether it is to sort of make do with limited resources to still feed your family, or whether it is to do with just in terms of like increased violence and abuse that takes place. Um, and I think we need to sort of engage with labor in a way and also sort of recognize and remunerate it adequately, which in a way, sort of intersects with the broader, broader conversations that we are having. And the other thing is that um, I think also speaking about the role of capitalism, you know, I mean, in the sense that it's, it's again, not an abstract concept. You know, we, it, it, we seem like a very loaded uh, word, but at the same time, it is what is affecting us and affecting and defining all our decisions and what we do. Um, and I think engaging with it in a way in terms of sort of seeing how domestic relationships are changing, how our relationships in the marketplace is changing, how, for instance, after climate crisis, so much cheap labor is available and then that becomes a rise in, there's a rise in trafficking, there's a rise in more extractive labor arrangements that take place as well. Um, so I think all of these are factors that we cannot look at the climate crisis as something which is an abstract idea or something that is yet to come. Uh, you know, it is a crisis that's already there. It's very much there. It's sort of, of course, rising and increasing in a way. And uh, there are various lessons that we can engage with. And uh, yeah, I think questioning the people in power, questioning ourselves um, is very, very uh, crucial in this whole conversation. Yeah, and then with that. To add just uh, also one thing, and then I make a, uh, an invitation for the, the, the work for the three of you. Because hey, Chica, for example, what you were talking about in, in the relationship with um, early marriage and so on, it was very nice that I, that I could see the comic. And it really helps to see. So, like, to, we are having the discussion, but there are different formats they work with. So, I just like take the opportunity to tell you to to get to see their work. It really adds up in everything we are discussing now. And it's like in the case of Hechik, it's like illustrative. It was very good for me to understand what you were discussing to see the comics, and we also help like. Uh, hope that the book can be translated if that's the aim because it's <laughs> uh, 
uh, to be translated in in many languages. For I could see like the introduction, and it's absolutely interesting. And also the work from Yvette uh, in different directions, and also as like what she writes, and as a small farmer, like the practice. So I'm just taking the opportunity to say. It's it really worth to, to get to know more about the work of these three women here. Um, let's see. Do you want to, to jump now into the final considerations? or uh, Maybe just, just a couple of words. I mean, I think the way I've been talking about it, and it is a very particular context because, you know, I'm embedded in my context in a tiny little country called Lebanon, but I also want, you know, to remind myself and remind us that these are global problems. I mean, the problem that got us here was a neoliberal model of progress uh, that was encouraged internationally. Um, and, you know, a uh, way an extractive sort of thinking, a for-profit kind of uh, mentality um, that sort of ran into a collapse the way it has in many other countries. And so to take it back to the transnational, I think, you know, even if the particularities sometimes are different from one context to another, um, I think, you know, we're all implicated and we're all connected and, you know, the problems are both local and global and so are the solutions and this is in, when we think about policy, but I think it's also in uh, attitude, values, approaches, practices, everything. Yvette. Uh, thank, thank you. Um, I'm actually rather hopeful at, at this point. Um, and, and that might sound a bit odd, but I guess it relates to, to being a historian. Um, what I did during lockdown, um, and we had a very harsh lockdown in our country, a very prompt and a very harsh one, thank heavens, because, because that kept our levels of sick people to somewhere around the, the place where our health system could actually cope. Um, and, and we had several great factors going for us in, in South Africa, we, we'd had the AIDS epidemic before this and in other parts of Africa, Ebola. And, and one of the things we built through the AIDS epidemic was an enormous people's movement. Um, we had a very, a very cantankerous, obstinate president who claimed AIDS wasn't a disease. So even in order to get access to treatment, we had to build a people's movement over a million strong. One, one of the, so, so when COVID came, it was very easy to take the people's movements that had been working for, you know, things like payment for home health care workers and, and access to treatment. And, 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 you know, they quickly turned themselves into, in, in, into a, a COVID force that would go out there and inform people and give them face masks and so on and teach them about social distancing and, 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 and so that, really made me rethink what people's struggle really means. It wasn't centrally directed. There was no huge theory about it. It literally came out of the struggle to survive. Um, I'm also connected to, 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 I want to call it an army of traditional healers, but something like 70% of the African population don't actually use Western medicine unless they... They're, they're very close to death. Um, most of our, what you would call primary health care goes through an army of barefoot doctors called traditional healers who, who rely on herbal medicines or traditional practices. So, so there's this very, very close connection between traditional healing and the health of the ecology. One of the things we did during COVID was search for a particular plant that traditionally was known to be very good for, for antiviral and, and chest infections and so on, only to find out the poor plant was almost extinct. I by accident grew it in my garden for, for totally different reasons. And so part of the work that I was doing, doing during COVID was digging up 
different medicinal plants and if you were an NGO or a feeding scheme, anybody that had some method of distribution, they would get sacks and sacks and sacks of this plant or that plant um, to, to, to distribute so that people could grow them in their own gardens. Um, and, and the outcome is we're now on the other side. 80% of South Africans have either had COVID or been vaccinated. Um, everybody that was going to die is pretty much dead, and we're now sitting with a young, highly educated, very, very healthy population. Um, the people from West Africa are saying very similar things. They're saying, oh, well, you know, we had Ebola and we had to put all these systems in place for Ebola and malaria. So when COVID came, we were like, okay, we're ready. And, and when they talk about systems, they talk about the same thing about people's movements. So, so that makes me optimistic. I, I think in relation to, to climate change, I think we're a heck of a lot stronger than we think we are. Um, I think we're much more organized than we think we are, and, and I think we're much more competent, much more powerful than we think we are. And, and sometimes it takes a global pandemic, a challenge like a global pandemic, to make us realize that, how unexpected resources spring into action. So, so I want to leave you on that note. I think when you go from here and you try and figure out what to do next, you're going to find that you have a lot more resources than are immediately obvious. Thank you. <laughs> That's a very nice way to end, actually. We, we passed through many things, and I hope we all like take something or a lot of things from the debate. We have like three more minutes, so I'll just ask one thing. If people want to follow your work, where should they... Let's just, you know, how should... How can they do it to follow your work? The best way can be like... For example, the, do you have a website for the, um, yeah, can, can you just mention? I, uh, yeah, I mean, we have social media. I don't remember. I'm old. I don't remember. Uh, I don't use them a lot. But you can access it all through our website, which is alwarsha.org, A-L-W-A-R-S-H-A dot org. Since I've been a journalist, I think I'm on social media and all over. <laughs> so in the sense that um, you can follow me on Twitter uh, as part of the Climate Brights project. So it's basically uh, at Climate Brights, C-L-I-M-A-T-E-B-R-I-D-E-S. -E -E and uh, yeah, we can engage there. Thanks. Yvette, what's the best way for people to follow your work? Um, I have a website. It's called koilife.com. Um, K H O E dot com, and I've tried to make sure that all my publications are, are, are available freely online and collected them all on that website. So, so you should be able to find um, most of my stuff there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. I think it was a lot, and I ask about the connections because then it can be a beginning and not just an end when we finish now. Uh, thank you for everybody that came, and that's it. I hope it's just the beginning for, for longer talks. Thank you so much for some great moderating. <laughs>